Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Catholic Truth Podcast, where we teach and preach the Catholic faith that comes from Jesus and the Apostles. We preach our Lord Jesus Christ and the Catholic faith, which comes down to us over 2,000 years. We want to help you to know your faith, love your faith, and to live it with purpose and passion. Our goal here at Catholic Truth is to set your faith on fire and even help you to explain it and defend it from people who attack it. And as you know, sometimes we have guests on this show, and we are very excited excited today to have a wonderful guest. His name is Roy Showman, and he is a Jewish convert to the Catholic faith. He was actually a business professor at the Harvard Law School. I'm sorry, the Harvard Business School. And he had a very powerful conversion to Christianity, and he's now a Catholic speaker, a Catholic author, and he has hosted many television series, including on EWTN, and he has written books and reviews, including his own book, which is Salvation is from the Jews. Uh, he also has a podcast and a uh, YouTube himself, which is called Salvation from the Jews, and I highly recommend this book. Uh, <clears throat> this book is actually wonderful, especially if you're not Jewish, you know, you're like myself, and you don't know the ins and outs of the Talmud in Jewish history. It's absolutely fascinating. And there are so many things in this book that I just did not know. And I'm a pretty well-read and well-studied person. Um, so I'd recommend Salvation is from the Jews. And I'd like to welcome to the show, Mr. Roy Showman. Thank you for joining us. Uh, sure. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, as I just said, you're book was fascinating, and uh, especially from a non-Jewish perspective, like someone like me who doesn't know uh, how much just the Bible proves Jesus as the Messiah. I know you went through a lot of those verses in your book. You also had a lot of Jewish history, things that I didn't know, like um, the, the scarlet thread turning to white, you know, before Jesus. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that miracle uh, and what happened afterwards, just as an example from the book? Let me, uh, let me, Put a little background to that. Um, <laughs> the problem is you wind me up and I might talk for an hour, so I have to be <laughs> careful. But um, there are a lot of parallels between the structure of Judaism and the structure of the Catholic Church, including that there is sacred scripture that's directly divinely revealed in Judaism, which is actually shared with the Catholic Church. It's the Old Testament, you know, the Hebrew scriptures. And there is also, you can think of it as like uh, magisterial teaching in Judaism, um, just like you have the magisterium in the Catholic Church and the accumulation of doctrine over the centuries that that might ra uh, rise to the level of dogma. And, and then at that point, it is like officially also revealed truth. I'm using the term incorrectly. I know that. But in a sense, it's revealed because it's been... Uh, given the stamp of approval through the magisterium under divine guidance, you know, so indirectly, in a sense, it's revealed, it's revealed to be true. The truth may not have been revealed, but the fact that it's true has been uh, certified by the Holy Spirit. Judaism has something similar, and uh, usually it's referred to as the Talmud, which is the written down Jewish oral tradition that has a weight that is... Um, comparable to the weight of sacred scripture. Just like church teaching, dogma has a weight that's comparable. I don't want to scandalize any of your Protestant you know, viewers, but that's comparable to uh, the weight of sacred scripture. Um, okay, so that's what the Talmud is. That's what the Jewish oral tradition is. Now, what's fascinating as a Jew in the Catholic Church or a Jew in Christianity is that in many places, the Talmud or the Jewish oral tradition written down confirms a lot of the truths of Christianity, even though that's the last thing they want to do. So there are many references in the Talmud, for instance, the fact that uh, Jesus existed, that he grew up in Egypt, that he was able to perform miracles, that after he died, his followers were able to perform miracles, even to the point of bringing back people at the point of death and so forth. That's all actually recounted in the Talmud, even though um, it's hard to find a Jewish rabbi who's going to admit it unless you already know. And one of the beautiful confirmations of uh, the truth that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah in the Talmud is the one that you referred to. See, I actually did get to your question eventually. <laughs> and it's referred to as the miracle of the scarlet thread or the miracle of the scarlet <clears throat> cord. And it appears both in the Talmud 
and also in the Zohar, which is um, uh, Kabbalah. It's a, it's a long story. It's a little less authoritative um, than the Talmud, although there's some Jews who consider it extremely authoritative because they take Kabbalah very seriously. So this miracle is recounted in both, and it's the following. Um, it is that, um, okay, um, in Judaism, the holiest day of the year is Yom Kippur. It is the day of repentance. It's a day of very strict fasting. It's the one day of the year when, in the days when the temple stood, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies. That's the only day of the year that anyone would enter the Holy of Holies. The high priest would enter the Holy of Holies on that one day and offer sacrifice for the remission of the sins of the Jewish nation as a whole. And uh, this was, of course, the, 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 the central sacramental event of the year in Judaism, right? And the before he entered the Holy of Holies, a scarlet cord would be hung around the entryway of the Holy of Holies. And um, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies. He would offer sacrifice for the remission of sins of the Jewish nation. And if God accepted the sacrifice and remitted the sins of the Jewish nation, that scarlet cord would miraculously turn white. So, you know, you could think of it as the whole Jewish nation, but of course it wasn't because it couldn't all fit, would be gathered around outside the Holy of Holies with their eyes fixed on this scarlet cord, waiting to see if it turned white. And if it turned white, there would be tremendous jubilation because it would mean that their sins had been forgiven. The Talmud and the Zohar both recount that this miracle happened almost every year. Um, occasionally, it would they it would miss a year, and that would be when the sins of the Jewish nation were so severe that it required a second year's uh, penance before they'd be remitted. But the Talmud recounts that this miracle occurred virtually every year until about forty years before the destruction of the temple. After after which point it never occurred again. What was 40 years before the destruction of the temple? The temple was destroyed about 70 AD. Um, 40 years before would have been about 30 AD, which is exactly when the crucifixion took place. So the Talmud itself recounts that subsequent to the crucifixion, the God no longer accepted the sacrifice on Yom Kippur for the remission of the sins of the Jewish nation. See, that's fascinating to me. Uh, it's just uh, unbelievable. And <clears throat> it just makes one's eyes open up, in my opinion. And uh, the book, people, Salvation is from the Jews, is just full of these kind of things that actually kind of prove Jesus and prove Christianity without knowing it, as uh, Mr. Shulman has said. So thank you for that. Uh, <clears throat> and just for let our me, viewers... Let me interject something there. Sure, please. Because um, I didn't write the book to prove Christianity. I wrote the book to prove Judaism. <laughs> the other side of the same coin is the book shows how um, Judaism is the foundation, the total foundation of Christianity, and that the Catholic Church and Judaism are not two independent religions. They are two phases of the same plan of salvation, mm -hmm. a preparation phase, which we have in Judaism, and a fulfillment phase, which we have in the Catholic Church and the sacraments. But it was always God's plan. I mean, he he came up with this like 4,000 year plan and the first 2,000 years would be preparation and the next 2,000 years would be spreading the, the fruits to the, throughout the whole world. And so that first preparation phase we know of as Judaism and the second phase we know of as Christianity or the Catholic Church. But it's not like two different religions. It's two phases of the same plan for salvation. Yeah, so that's a great way of I, I actually at wrote it. the book more to open Catholics' eyes to the truth of Judaism than to open Jews' eyes to the truth of the Catholic Church. And that did it as well, absolutely. Um, all, of the, all of the information that you had on Judaism was very fascinating as well. And um, you're, I'm sure your podcast and your YouTube channel have a lot more information as well, so I direct your, uh, our listeners to go there. Uh, in your and just for our listeners, just so you know, today we're talking about the uh, illegal trial of Jesus. I had read an article by Mr. Showman about 27 laws, I believe it was 27 laws, that the Jewish leaders broke just to uh, have Jesus crucified. And these are the same leaders that 
followed the letter of the law, you know, and were known for following the law down to the last detail and perhaps even being uh, holier than thou about it. But uh, before we get to these laws, maybe you could just touch on really quickly, uh, why do you think uh, they broke these laws, first of all? Why were they so threatened with Jesus? Like, what was their relationship, do you think, with Jesus? I think it's very telling that when you read, and this is Holy Week, so it's a good time to be thinking about this. When you read the account of um, Caiaphas before the Sanhedrin, you see that he never asks the question, is Jesus the Messiah? He only says things like, it's better that one man should perish than that the whole nation should be lost. He says, um, what are we going to do now after the raising of Lazarus? He says, what are we going to do now? If we let him continue, the whole nation will follow after him. They're very concerned about Jesus's effect on the hierarchy of Judaism. But Caiaphas never even asked the question, is his claim true to be the Messiah? Um, so I think that tells it, really. I don't think he wanted to know. <laughs> um, one could argue on the basis of the parables that Jesus gave that he did know, you know, the parable of the um, vineyard owner, which took place today, by the way, probably on Holy Tuesdays when Jesus told that parable in the temple. I mean, it was really good. But the vineyard owner who went away and let out his vineyard to uh, tenant farmers and sent representatives to collect the crops every year. And the uh, tenant farmers would, you know, kill the representatives, would stone them, whatever. So finally, the vineyard owner said he'll send his son and the shoe to respect him. And then they said, well, let's kill the son. And now we get to own everything. So that parable suggests that the uh, high priest actually knew that Jesus was the Messiah. But outside of that parable, I think you could argue that it's more like um, don't see what's it don't ask don't tell that uh, Caiaphas was probably scared that Jesus might be the Messiah and he didn't want to know one way or the other he just wanted to be done with him because of course what Jesus was doing would remove um, all of the authority and all of the perks and all of the power and all of the ability of abuse that the high priesthood represented in those days. And again, the Talmud itself, the Talmud itself recounts how at the, it doesn't say at the time of Jesus, but it says essentially at the time of Caiaphas, how totally corrupt the high priesthood was. It uses mm -hmm. phrases like a brood of vipers. And um, actually those phrases are in, in the book, but I don't remember them offhand. But the Talmud itself says that the high priesthood had fallen into total corruption and was simply, um, uh, you know, well, <laughs> I don't know how incorrect I want to be, but um, it was it was worthy of Cardinal McCarrick. Oh wow! <laughs> Thank you. Um, so maybe we could go through some of these laws that the Jewish leaders broke. I mean, apparently, as you said, there or hinted at, their hearts were hardened. They didn't want to accept Jesus, or they couldn't because they themselves were corrupt, and we understand that in some ways. But maybe we could go through some of these laws that they broke just to get Jesus killed and um, to show, you know, why they were problematic. I have very thin skin, I guess. I wouldn't use the word their hearts were hardened because that, that phrase is used in Scripture to refer to God hardening hearts. Uh, and, and in particular, in Romans 11, it's used by St. Paul to refer to the fact that um, God arranged for the Jews not to recognize Jesus because it was part of divine providence, whereas this was a different kind of hardening of the heart. This was, um, you know, falling into serious sin, choosing sin, uh, you know, a lusting for power and so forth. But it was their sin that hardened their hearts, not divine providence. Sure. I just wanted to, because that phrase is actually a key phrase um, in Romans 11, having to do with the conversion of the Jews. So I okay. just want Thank to you. draw a line there. Um, sure. But actually, I want to go back a little bit in time because it makes, I think it's actually, I don't know how to put it, but it, it 
shows it very, vi very vibrantly, which is that the Sanhedrin had met and condemned Jesus to death three separate times before Holy Thursday, okay? Thereby proving that the trial that we see in the Passion of the Christ and the trial that we see between Holy Thursday night and the crucifixion on Friday was a kangaroo court because the Sanhedrin had actually sentenced him to death three times before that. And that's evident in the Gospels. So <laughs> I'll leave it up to you. Um, should I skip over, should I skip that or should I go into that rap about how the Sanhedrin, see, well, for the Sanhedrin to condemn Jesus to death in the absence of, of um, allowing him to defend himself, in the absence of witnesses, in the absence of being a formal uh, trial with a possible death sentence, that in itself is a total violation of Jewish law because there were very, very strict laws about under what circumstances the Sanhedrin could issue a death sentence. And those were totally violated in the preceding sentences of death. And um, I'll just very briefly show the proof from the Gospels how Jesus was clearly under a death sentence. And it's clear from the Gospels that the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish high court, you could say, had met uh, in September, about six months before um, Easter, before Good Friday, and condemned Jew uh, Jesus to death. And we know that from the passage in John 7, when which says, um, after this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. In other words, they had already issued a death sentence on him. When Jesus says the Jews sought to kill him, it was not you know, an Antifa group in Jerusalem. It wasn't the rabble that were seeking to kill him. That meant that the Jewish authorities had already, were already seeking to kill him, had already given him a death sentence. And um, that's uh, discussed further in the same chapter when Jesus went secretly up to Jerusalem. This is now the Feast of Tabernacles. When Jesus had said, I'm not gonna go because the Jews are seeking to kill me. Then he goes up secretly and when the Jews see him there, they say, um, uh, the Jews say, how does this man have this learning? You know, he's never gone to school. And uh, then Jesus replies, why do you seek to kill me? And the people say, isn't this not the man they seek to kill? So they sought to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. Again, it's clear that it is the Jewish authorities who were wanted to arrest him and kill him because they had already given him a death sentence. And then we see uh, this proven in John 9 when the man who was born blind gets his sight. You remember that, I hope, mm -hmm. out there in, in podcast land. And um, the Jewish authorities go up to the man's parents and say, how did, how did your son get his sight back? And they say, um, we know he was born blind, but as to the rest, you'd better ask him. And then the Gospels say his parents said this because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess him to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. OK, so basically this is saying that the Sanhedrin, the, the penalty for following a false messiah was automatic excommunication. So when the Gospels say if anyone should confess him to be the Messiah, he was to be put out of the synagogue, means that the Sanhedrin had already ruled that Jesus was a false Messiah. Because that's why the penalty for being a follower of his would be excommunication. But the penalty for being a false Messiah was the death sentence. So this is further proof that the Sanhedrin had already passed a death sentence on Jesus. I'm gonna skip the, 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 the next time because there was another time in February of um, the year that Jesus was killed. Um, maybe it wasn't, uh, it was around February. Uh, basically that shows how the Sanhedrin met again and again uh, passed the death sentence over Jesus. Wow. So anyway, so <clears throat> the whole thing was, was a kangaroo court. Now during the trial itself, there were any number, huge number of violations of Jewish law that were designed specifically 
to protect the Sanhedrin from uh, wrongly condemning someone to death. And um, I'll uh, I'll just I'll just run through a few. Um, the um, let me uh, pull up some 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 notes here. Um, the the only the the Sanhedrin had to meet during daylight hours if it was going to be a capital crime, uh, and it met at night. That was clear. Um, the judges there had to be a twenty four hour period between uh, I don't remember was twenty four or forty eight between the issuance of the death sentence and the execution itself to allow time for any other witnesses to come forward or for the judges to change their mind. And we know that he was immediately put to death. The Sanhedrin had to meet in only one place, the Hall of Hewn Stones, if it was going to be a capital crime. It couldn't just meet at Caiaphas's house, which is where it met. Um, the witnesses had to be questioned separately. They were all questioned together. We see this in the gospels. Um, they had to be warned beforehand that should they give false testimony, the penalty that would have been inflicted on the defendant would be inflicted on them, which would mean that they would be put to death. That obviously was not done. Um, the uh, defendant had to be treated with dignity and respect. <laughs> that was hardly done. <laughs> That's Jesus, of course. Um, the, uh, the, the, the Lots of small things were violations, like the chief priest was specifically prohibited from rending his garment, which of course he did. And the, the uh, ruling of the judges had to be done in a very formal manner where each judge individually gets questioned by the clerk, you know, do you rule guilty or innocent? And then the, the votes tabulated. And of course I wasn't done. Caiaphas just, just, you know, calls out what should be done and they all shout, you know, whatever, crucify him. Um, yeah, didn't he say at one point, like, what need of we of witnesses? We don't need witnesses. Let's just oh, yeah, that's <laughs> true. That's another really big deal, which is that um, it was prohibited. It's like the, is it the, uh, it's the Fifth Amendment. Um, it was prohibited from allowing, the, the, the defendant was not allowed to give testimony against himself. And he was not allowed to be um, asked for testimony against himself. So when Caiaphas is, says to Jesus, you know, what do you answer? Look at these people's accusations against you. Jesus remains silent, remember, until Caiaphas says, I adjure you by the living God, you know, testify. The reason Jesus remains silent is because Jesus did not want to um, cause Caiaphas to sin. And, and for Jesus to testify against himself, um, would be uh, for Caiaphas to get Jesus to testify was to sin on Caiaphas's part. So Jesus refused to testify to protect Caiaphas from sinning by requiring the defendant to testify. Hmm. Uh, so that was yet another violation. I, you said there's 70, uh, I think I, or 27, I think I claimed in the article. Um, in fact, that entire article is plagiarism from some Jewish converts known as the Lehman Brothers in the 19th century. And they counted a much larger number in the 70s, but um, they wrote a whole book going through the 70 plus uh, wow. violations. So when I wanted to make a short article, I cut it down to like 27 or something violation. Um, before we continue, where do these, uh, where, just for our listeners and our viewers, where can these violations be found? Like, I know they were known to the Jewish people, but, you know, and obviously they were in some sort of law, law or Talmud somewhere, but where exactly did they come from? First of all, the, the, the laws, the laws are in the Talmud, but they're all over scattered over the Talmud. And um, the Talmud itself is like the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's like 26 volumes or so, and it's, you know, about, you know, three feet long. The, um, I wrote an article which was um, printed in Inside the Vatican Magazine a number of years ago. It's up on my website, salvationisfromthejews.com. I have a, you know, section on the banner saying articles and interviews or something like that. And it's in there. Um, and, um, I probably have a couple of podcasts that go through it, but in any case, 
I don't know what exactly what you mean. I think the only place that a Catholic can easily find this um, exploration in in Jewish um, uh, law is probably look at my article on my website or inside the Vatican. I think what I meant is that these laws were obviously well known to the Jewish leaders. They would have known these laws, and yet they just chose to ignore them for whatever reason. Well, is that again. Let me just say, see, the nice thing about Cardinal McCarrick is it's not scandalous to use his name because, because you know, <laughs> his conviction comes from the church court. Right. So Cardinal McCarrick certainly knew that you weren't allowed to mess around with somebody in the confessional and then give him absolution. You know, he knew the laws, too. Um, of course, this is a corruption of of power. What's that old line? Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Right. And um, the Jews don't have a monopoly on that. Yeah, it's very interesting. I thought um, one of the ones I thought was interesting was that uh, each witness had to swear an oath and um, the the witnesses had to give separate testimonies um, apart from the ones that they accused. And it just seems to me that it all happened in the same room <laughs> Nobody swore an oath. It was just kind of almost like a rushed, like a very hasty uh, condemnation. And all the lynching. witnesses have to agree. And it says explicitly in the Gospels that no two witnesses agreed. So mm -hmm. Caiaphas got impatient, right? Um, it's it's kind of neat because it looks to me when you read the Gospels like, like either the Holy Spirit or the person writing the Gospels was actually aware of the Jewish law. So they kept pointing out all of these violations of the Jewish law. Yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, uh, and, and, and just for our viewers, you're going to be hearing these in a few days uh, on Holy Thursday, Good Friday. Uh, you're going to hear the condemnation of Jesus, so you can you know be listening for these. But one that just came to mind was, I think <clears throat> you had mentioned that it was supposed to happen during the day, and maybe I think you just mentioned this, but it happened at night, and there were supposed to be other witnesses as well. But And then one of the Pharisees uh, I don't remember if it was Joseph or Nicodemus, but they're like, where's the rest of the council? And why is this happening at night? It's, you know, this is in a sense an abomination. So even they saw that it was problematic and they got put out. Is that right? Well, yeah. Well, basically, this is like, um, <laughs> um, this is like uh, Chief, you know, like Justice Thomas or something, you know, in the face of the rest of the Supreme Court. <laughs> I mean, in other words, every so often you actually have a straight judge who isn't corrupt. <laughs> and he essentially just gets thrown the door by the, you know, corrupt judges. Yeah, it's very, no, it's very interesting. Um, are there any, and one, another one I see is that uh, the death sentence must be postponed until the next day. Uh, but they didn't do that, did they? No, um, the, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll run through this since, since you're doing, okay. The court could not meet on a Sabbath or a feast day or on the day before a Sabbath or a feast day. It met on the day before uh, Passover. Um, the uh, it could not take place at night. The witnesses must give their testimony separately, and that if you remember the scene in Daniel, that's how Daniel yeah. discovers that Susanna was falsely accused. I think mm. her name was Susanna. Um, the before testifying, the witnesses must uh, take an oath, and, and may, they must be reminded that they suffer the penalty uh, if they give perjured testimony that the defendant would have. Um, the uh, no testimony is valid unless all the witnesses agree in every detail. And of course, we saw that Caiaphas threw up his hand saying, what am I going to do? None of these guys agree about anything. <laughs> um, the accused must not be condemned on his own confession, and he may not be um, asked to confess. And we saw that's why Jesus refused to um, answer Caiaphas when he asked him. Uh, the judge's behavior toward the accused must be humane and kind, treating him with gentleness and respect. Scratch that. Um, the accuser cannot also be the judge, and Caiaphas was simultaneously the accuser and the judge. Um, the, um, the, the judges must be solicited one by one as to their judgment, not just, you know, call out what you say and they all shout back, he deserves death. Um, the, the execution of the sentence has to be delayed, as you mentioned. Um, the, uh, um, anyway, I'll just stop there, but it just goes on.
Yeah, it's it's fascinating. Um, it's extremely fascinating. It, it's you know for people who prided themselves on following the letter of the law and just to throw it all out the window, uh, it's it's just very interesting. And Jesus condemned them many times. Yes, they followed the law, but their hearts weren't right. And I believe it was Matthew twenty three where Jesus says, "Who is going to save you?" You know, from going to hell. I mean, you're you yourselves are children of hell, and you're leading other people there as well. And he has this long list of woes and condemnations for the scribes and Pharisees. And uh, I guess it's no wonder that they didn't like him. <laughs> no, but I I, I want to say, I mean, I'm you know, I I don't want to say I'm super Catholic, but I obviously I'm totally, you know, totally totally bought into the Catholic Church. But I think that um, especially in our day, it's extremely interesting to, uh, okay, to look at the parallel between the uh, Jewish authorities in the days of Jesus and some of our Catholic authorities today, mm -hmm. because in fact, <laughs> you know, God is the same God, Satan is the same Satan, human nature is the same human nature. And I think what we see in the New Testament is a picture of how a religious hierarchy is vulnerable to a kind of wholesale corruption. Um, this isn't about the Jews. It's about human nature. Mm -hmm. And it's also about spiritual warfare. But of course, the spiritual warfare at the time of Jesus centered on Jesus. And, and the spiritual warfare today centers on the Catholic Church. Yeah, trying to destroy his church. Um, and what do, what do Jews think about Jesus today, people who are still Jewish? What, I, do they see him as like a nice teacher? Do they see him as a completely false prophet? Like, are there different views of him? How do they view him? There are different views. And um, uh, it also changes over time. When I was growing up, uh, the consensus was that he was a false prophet and his followers um, had a very destructive effect on Judaism and the next 2000 years of Jewish history. Uh, nowadays, it's more popular uh, to say, oh, he was really a wonderful rabbi teaching the heart of Judaism and his followers, you know, got the wrong end of the stick and decided he was the Messiah and uh, put all these words in his mouth he never said and made it out that he was he claimed to be the Messiah when he never claimed to be the Messiah. Uh, that's mm -hmm. pretty popular because, you see, we live in the age of nice, right? And everything's supposed to be, I'm okay and you're okay. And so um, when I was growing up, that wasn't an I'm okay, you're okay kind of a storyline. But today's is kind of an I'm okay, you're okay. Because it, it lets um, the Jewish community say that Jesus was wonderful. And it also actually enables the Jewish community to kind of lay claim to him and say, see, he's one of ours. And everything that you love about his teaching was really just uh, real Judaism and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a much, you know, friendlier view. It almost sounds like the tarif of Islam, uh, where they basically say that uh, the Bible agreed with Islam, but then it was corrupted over time and the message was corrupted by the apostles and, the you know, watered down over time. And now it just, it supports Christianity, but it, it never did in the past. That's, a, that's actually an interesting parallel. I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, that is a way of co-opting um, co-opting the religion in a way yeah so uh <clears throat> do you have any closing thoughts on or uh, you know thoughts on the trial of jesus itself or the laws of jesus or the laws that were broken or anything like that any uh other thoughts that you might be able to add <laughs> only only the uh like sixty four thousand dollar kind of question I, I don't have the quote in front of me i think unfortunately but the uh, catechism of the council of trent in the uh, 16th century, right, says very clearly, it is a, it is wrong to think that the Jews condemned Jesus to the crucifixion. All of man's sins condemned Jesus to the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. And the Jews didn't know that he was the Messiah, but we Catholics, when we sin, we condemn him to the crucifixion, we add to his tortures, and we know he's the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we're not in a position to cast stones. Uh, the entire story of the New Testament is, needless to say, divine providence down to the smallest detail. You know, the 30 pieces of silver, the betrayal, mm -hmm. the cock crowing, absolutely everything is divine providence. 
And it was it did not come about because the Jews were particularly evil people. It came about because God wanted to save mankind through the death, suffering and death and resurrection of his only begotten son, Jesus. Yeah. He was the only one who could save us. He's the he only, the only the one who could one take who could all of our... Us. Yeah, our infinite amount of sins required an infinite person to do so. But God didn't need to suffer, so he became man to suffer on our behalf. And thank you, Jesus. And as Pope Francis uh, recently said, uh, this is Holy Week. So take a little while uh, to think about the death of Jesus, to think about his sufferings, to think about what he did for you, and walk a little bit more in that way yourself. Uh, I want to thank you for coming on our show, and I want to. I'm going to put in the show notes down below in our description show notes. We're going to add your YouTube there, your podcast, your book, yeah. your website, so people can find you. But uh, thank you so much for coming on the show with us today. Sure, thanks for inviting me again, and uh, you know, you know, spread the gospel. Amen. And uh, thank you all for tuning in to this wonderful show. And thank you all for tuning into Catholic Truth and for supporting our ministry as we try to save souls and change lives. And please check out our show notes down below and follow us on our Facebook, our Instagram, check out our podcast, YouTube, and anything else. Thank you all. Please pray for us. We are praying for you. God bless you.